So hi everyone, welcome to our first, uh, second talk of the NCU Delta Online Talk series. Uh, I'm Ian Chenpan, your host tonight. So sorry, I have to do this the same introduction every time since you know there might be some new audience. Um, so for those who haven't heard it before, this talk series will be given by um, all the awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lecture uh, Lectureship Award. And this award was established by National Central uh, University and Delta Electronics Foundation um, to recognize uh, young scholars under the age of 45 who have made outstanding contribution in this field. So each year, the awardee will be invited to Taiwan to interact with the local astronomers and the public. So I think the first award was given in 2012, uh, which is almost 10 years ago. So the original plan for this year was to hold a um, big event for, you know, by inviting all the previous awardees to come to Taiwan to celebrate but uh, things have been um, you know, difficult due to this COVID-19. So we have decided to make this online, unfortunately. But the good thing is, you know, probably more people can join uh, this event, which is not limited to the people in Taiwan. So our speaker today is uh, Professor Chris Reynolds from the University of Cambridge. So it's our uh, great pleasure to have him here. So Chris, we see, uh, I think you received this world in 2013. Yeah, and now it's a Plumian professor in the University of Cambridge, right? Uh, which is a very prestigious professorship, uh, which, you know, which included many big names like uh, Eddington Martin Rees. Yeah, I Googled this, uh, Richard Ellis and Robert Kennicott. Uh, those are very big names. So Chris is a uh, like a world renowned expert in accretion and jets of supermassive black holes from uh, GR magneto hydrodynamic simulations of black hole accretion disks to AGN feedbacks in, in GAX clusters. And he his works involve you know, both numerical simulations and X-ray data analysis. And I believe he was one of the pioneers in using X-ray like iron lines for measuring spin of black holes and in using X-ray variability to infer the corona properties uh, in the Christian disk uh, systems. So I have to admit that I actually borrowed this very nice introduction from Karen. So. <laughs> So who is now professor of um, National Tsinghua University because she is a very close collaborator of, of Chris. So thank you very much, Karen. So um, so today Chris is going to talk about this very exciting black holes. So Chris, I'll let you take this away. Uh, can uh, share your screen. Thank you very much, uh, Yingcheng. And so yes, so um, thank you very much for um, such a nice introduction. And thank you for the invitation to to give this this talk. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I, I I remember with great fondness my visits to NCU back in 2013. Um, you could, I don't know if you've got eagle eyes on the video, but uh, I actually have the award on my um, on my cover back behind me. Um, and uh, I, I I look forward to one day visiting visiting again. So today I'm going to um, start off by I'm, I'm going to be telling you about some work we've been doing on what is really quite a quite a, a basic and fundamental question, which is why do accreting black holes vary? Why do they why do they um, vary in time? And um, let me just start off with a with a broad introduction to to accreting black holes. And I'll tell you why this is actually an interesting question that, that, that we've been we've been looking at. But firstly, the broad introduction. You know, if you if you look out into the universe um, with say the Hubble Space Telescope, so you look out in with 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 optical um, optical eyes, then you see a universe full of uh, full of galaxies and full of stars. So this, of course, is the famous Hubble Deep Field. Um, essentially, everything you're seeing here is a galaxy. There's maybe one or two stars in this whole image. But essentially, everything you're seeing is a galaxy, many of them very distant galaxies. And, um, and yet the actual light you're seeing here is, is all starlight. It's all starlight from, from, from the galaxies, uh, the, the stars in the galaxies themselves. Now, if you actually stare out in the universe with uh, an X-ray telescope, you can actually get a, a very, very different view of it. So um, if we now go to the uh, Chandra deep field, this is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, you get this, um, this field of, 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 it looks like a field of stars. In fact, every single point here is thought to be a, a black hole, or more precisely, 
an accreting black hole, an accreting supermassive black hole sitting at the center of, um, of a galaxy. So the X-ray sky is dominated by these so-called active galactic nuclei. Fundamentally, what we believe um, is the power source of these, uh, th these objects is gases falling into supermassive black holes. Uh, the black holes can have a vast range of masses. Um, the, the small ones are a mere 100,000 times um, the mass of the sun, but that can go all the way up to billions of solar masses. Um, so they can have a huge range of masses depending upon the galaxies they, they sit in. And if you do a, a count, you know, you count up how many AGN we see when we, when we look out and you count up how many galaxies we see, we find that about 1% of galaxies actually host one of these one of these powerful AGN. And in their extreme cases, um, the, the AGN can actually outshine their galaxy by, a fact, by some extreme factor, factors of 100 or even 1,000. You know, in the extreme case, the energy coming out of, the, of, the, of these um, centers of these galaxies can, can be vastly more than the energy in all the, all the stars put together. Now, many of the, of the AGN we see in this particular image, for example, um, are actually rather distant objects. So many of them will be you know, six or seven billion light years away. So when the universe was, a, was a, a half its, its current age, but we don't have to look out at such extreme distances to find these objects. Um, this is a one particularly nice example. This is the Centaurus A galaxy, which is, uh, is really on our doorstep. Um, and what we have here is another example of one of these powerful active galactic nuclei. So at the very center of this, of this galaxy, we believe that there's a, a supermassive black hole, probably in the billion solar mass range. And um, there's a tremendous amount of, of X-ray emission coming from this object that we can see if we look with X-ray telescopes. We also see in this particular example, uh, another phenomenon that's quite common, which is that there can be powerful jets coming out of the center of these, of these objects. So some process associated with gas falling into the black hole can produce uh, jets of matter that are squirting out of the center of the galaxy. Um, principally are seen via radio emission that they, they create. So these are called radio jets and radio galaxies. Um, but this is another way that energy is released from the core of this galaxy. It can be released as the kinetic energy of, um, of material that is, that is being ejected from the, from the centers of these galaxies. So, so this is the phenomenon of, of active galactic, galactic nuclei. So um, if we were to zoom in on the very center of one of these objects, see exactly what's, what's going on, what we might see is, is something like this. We have uh, the supermassive black hole itself at the very center. Of course, this is a, um, a, a, a massive object with extremely strong gravitational field. So um, by the time you actually get up to the event horizon, the, the, escape, the escape speed is the speed of light. And uh, in these active galactic nuclei, there is gas that's falling into them. They fall in via this accretion disk, so the gas spirals into the, into the black hole. As it does that, it is uh, releasing energy. Um, it's giving up its, uh, its, gravitational, its gravitational energy. This is a process that is uh, very akin, actually, to hydroelectric power. So in, in hydroelectric um, energy, we have water that is you know, falling down some, um, some distance. It's falling off a, off a dam, for example. And uh, if we were to put turbines in the, in, in the way and, and extract the energy from it, we can actually power you know, generators. So we can actually extract the energy as water is falling down, down some, some slope. Well, in fact, we can get energy out of uh, black hole systems in very much you know, a, a parallel way. We have matter that's falling towards the black hole. Um, it will be giving up uh, gravitational energy um, the difference compared to the compared to the hydroelectric dam is just the uh, amount of energy is, is, that is being given up. If, of course, Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, this tells us that there can be a conversion of, of mass into, into energy. And what we find is um, if we, for example, drop one kilogram of matter from a large distance into a black hole, we can convert about 10% of that one kilogram into energy. So the efficiency is about 10%. And that translates into the equivalent of about 2 million tons of TNT exploding. 
So dropping one kilogram um, into a black hole releases um, the amount of energy that a very sizable nuclear weapon would, would, would release. So these, this is an incredibly efficient process. And then, of course, in these active galactic nuclei, you know, we're not dropping one kilogram in. We are dropping you know, many, um, we can drop you know, many solar masses per year into the black hole, and that's what generates the, the, the extreme energies. So that's the fundamentals of, of how an active galactic, of what the active galactic nuclei are. Now, this talk is going to be focused on the variability of active galactic nuclei. And this is actually a huge topic. There's many different facets of the variability. Um, we know that active galactic nuclei must turn on and turn off. Um, one way we know that is that if they didn't turn off and they just had this amount of matter pouring into them for the age of the universe, the black holes would be vastly much, vastly larger than what we actually see. But we can also actually see direct observational evidence for black holes turning on and off. This is one example. This is um, the uh, Hercules A radio galaxy. And again, here we have uh, in the red is a radio map of this galaxy and in the, the, the white is, is the background um, uh, optical image. But you can see in the jet that it very much looks like the jet is stopping and starting. So we have uh, the jet is flowing outwards, but it looks like there's different uh, events here, different series of ejections down the jet. And we believe that in, indeed in, in some of these systems, that's what's going on. The jet is stopping and starting, stopping and starting, um, on time scales of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 years. So this is one example of how active galactic nuclei are, um, can, can vary. But the variability I'm going to focus on in this talk is the much more rapid variability we see. And this is one of these amazing facts of active galactic nuclei, that they can, they can change their power output incredibly quickly. So this is one, one particular active galactic nucleus. It goes by a um, a, a very unmemorable name of IRAS 13224. And this is a light curve from that object from the um, XML Newton Observatory. So it's an, an X ray light curve. And the top panel here is um, our soft X rays, so low energy X rays. The, the bottom panel is hard X rays. And um, this whole trace is only you know, about a week long. So one day is this, uh, is this bar up here, this red bar. And you can see that this object is tremendously variable. There, there are flares in this object where it can double in power and then halve again in only you know, an hour or two. So that the length of this talk, the AGN can double its energy output and then, and then have, it, um, have it drop again. And remember, there's you know, the amount of energy coming out uh, in, in, in this particular object in the X-rays is actually comparable to the to the uh, total stellar output of the whole galaxy. So you have this amazingly powerful object that is modulating its power on really very, very short time scales. And the focus of this talk is going to be um, the question, how does it do this? You know, what, what, what is going on that's driving this kind of, of very rapid variability? Um, and the, and um, so that, that, that's going to be the focus of, of this talk. So what processes drive the, this, this, this virus variability? Well, let me firstly start by just addressing the question of, of why do we care about, about this? Um, there's two answers to that. One is that we care because uh, we can use observations of the variability as a probe for the properties of the AGN itself. What, we will, what, what I will show you a little bit later is that different AGN have different variability characteristics. Some of them um, are uh, are varying more slowly and some of them are varying um, faster. And in fact, also the variability you see depends upon the wave band you're looking at. If you're looking at the X-rays versus optical or ultraviolet, you get different, different um, observed variability. So um, we can, in principle, you know, if we understand variability, we can use observations of variability to measure, for example, black hole mass or measure properties of the accretion disk um, or measure other such other interesting properties of the object. Um, then the second, the second reason why we care is that, well, you know, this is a 
a mysterious and, and uh, impressive phenomenon. We just want to know how it works. You know, we're astrophysicists. We want to get to the bottom of the physics of how this works. So the rest of this talk, I will um, will will be organised like this. I'll I'll start off by just a, an introduction to what I call modern accretion disk theory, and this is really the the theory of accretion disks that's based upon the idea that um, disks are magnetized turbulent systems. And I'll introduce the, the idea that we can now, with, with, this, um, with this insight, we can actually do very effective computer simulations of, of accretion disks. Then I'll, um, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate to you, hopefully, that the accretion disks that we can simulate in our computers actually capture the essence of the variability that we actually see in nature. We sort of capture most of the, the gross um, aspects of the variability that we see in nature. And then we can start to dig into the simulations to see, well, okay, what, what is actually going on? And um, I'll uncover the role of, of some quite subtle nonlinear dynamics, especially related to, um, to so-called dynamos and dynamo cycles. And then I'll end up by um, sort of bringing it back towards the more observational side of things and discussing how the insights that we are getting from these kind of um, th this kind of theory it can help us understand the results we get from the next generation large um, uh, time domain surveys, such as, for example, would be possible with the Vera Rubin telescope and, and uh, LSST. So let's let, let's start off. Um, and let me now sort of return to, to this accretion disk and let's, let's talk a little bit more detail about how, how, it, actually, how it actually works. So we have a, a black hole with, with a disk of material around it. And of course, um, the energy that we see is liberated because there's a mass inflow through the, through the disk. Um, and as the mass flows inwards, it's releasing its gravitational potential energy. However, the, um, it's actually not clear, it's not obvious um, why the mass falls in. And the reason for that, and in fact, the real crux of accretion disk physics is the fact that the, the, the gas has angular momentum. So left to its own devices, the gas would really just orbit the black hole, potentially orbit the black hole for a very, very, very long time before falling in. So to put that in a little bit more detail, um, the matter has uh, a specific angular momentum. So each kilogram of matter has an angular momentum that's given by, by this, gm times r all square rooted. So the matter that is further away from the black hole has more angular momentum than the matter that's closer in. And in order to actually fall in, in order to actually accrete, um, the matter needs to lose its angular momentum. So the question is, how, do, how does that happen? So one possibility, which is the sort of upper arrow on this, is that there's a wind or a jet that can carry carry the angular momentum away from this right away from the disk, um, and for example, that wind might be magnetically connected to the disk and can just sort of help slow the material down so it can it can fall in, and um, that may well happen in some systems. In fact, in in accreting uh, in young stars in proto in, in proto uh, stellar disks, there's actually some good observational evidence that this kind of thing might be happening. Um, one aspect is, however, that many models of this that you would put together actually then would not have the um, infall material lose its energy. Basically, the energy would just go into driving, driving this, this wind rather than radiating in the disk. So in order to get the kind of very luminous disks that, that we infer from AGM, we believe the angular momentum must be actually transported outwards in the flow through some dissipative physics. So basically there's, there's some dissipative physics that lets the angular momentum sort of be transported outwards from the inner material to the outer material. Um, and that's, that's what drives the, drives the accretion. So how does that happen? Well, um, you know, you might, you might have thought if you, if you sort of came at this problem with, um, as a fluid dynamics problem, that maybe there's viscosity in the gas. So the material close in is orbiting around very fast compared to the material that's further out. So there'd be a shear in the flow. Um, and therefore, if there's any shear viscosity, the material that is um, further out would sort of help slow down the material that's closer in and that would take angular momentum away. And it would 
it would fall in. Um, you can characterize the importance of viscosity via something called the Reynolds number. Um, and that's no relation to me. That's uh, uh, Dr. Reynolds. This, this, this Reynolds was in the eight, uh, late 1800s and, and did a lot of classic fluid dynamics. Um, so the Reynolds number, which is uh, essentially a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. So the, if the Reynolds number is very high, it means that viscosity is relatively unimportant. And if you just put numbers in for what you think the intrinsic molecular viscosity of, of, of the accreting gas should be, you get Reynolds numbers that are something like 10 to the power 12. Um, and this roughly means, if you, if you do some back of the envelope um, calculations, this roughly means the matter has to orbit around the black hole about 10 to the 12 times before accreting. And that just is far too slow. That's much longer than the age of the universe for the kind of systems we're talking about. So we conclude that the intrinsic viscosity um, is ineffective at enabling accretion. That doesn't work. Um, and uh, we, we can look around in the universe and find examples of disks that are not accreting. So this is a very famous example of a disk that is not accreting. And it's not accreting for the same reason. The, 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 the particles that make up the rings of Saturn um, and of course, the small moonlets in there too have angular momentum, and they just quite happily go around Saturn um, for potentially you know, billions of years. Um, so, um, so what what is happening? Well, in fact, we can um, we can find some uh, we we can we can find the answer in our cup of English tea. So the same problem actually exists in our cup of tea. If we take a cup of of tea, and of course in in England, um, I, mean, I actually don't particularly like English tea, but, but those who do like often putting milk in it. And when they put milk in it, they stir it. And um, if you do the same calculation we just did for our accretion disk, you find that the Reynolds number of the tea in our cup is about 30,000, um, which means that the tea should, should spin around about 30,000 revolutions before stopping. That would take about a day. And that is just not true, of course. You know, we, if we stir a cup of tea, it stops, it stops rotating in, in a minute or so. Uh, what's going on? Well, if you uh, look in detail at the uh, hydrodynamics of your, of your cup of tea, what you find is that because the base of the um, cup of tea is, is uh, at the bottom of the cup is at rest, you actually set up um, a secondary flow. You set up something called an Ekman flow uh, and in order to satisfy the boundary condition at the bottom of the, of the cup. And uh, the result is that you have the Ekman flow that interacts with the rotation and ultimately your cup of tea becomes turbulent. So, and that's why the milk actually mixes because the cup of tea is turbulent. So the, the solution in, in tea is that the gas is, is the, 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 uh, the tea is turbulent. Now, back in the 70s, the same problem or the same potential solution was recognized for accretion disks. So in, in a very, in a classic paper, Shakura and Senyev in 1973 argued that the angular momentum is carried through an accretion disk via the action of turbulence or a so-called anomalous viscosity that can exist in, in turbulent gases. And they argued through uh, essentially dimensional analysis that the stresses in the disk, the, the, the forces that are going to transport the angular momentum, um, are proportional to some parameter alpha that is of order unity um, or less times the pressure in the in the in the gas. So this is this is the basis of what's called the alpha model. Um, now Shakur and Sanyev couldn't specify what actually drove the turbulence. So they said, well, if if the gas is turbulent motivated by the fact the Reynolds number is so high, then this is what happens. But they couldn't actually figure out what drove the turbulence. And so that's kind of this, uh, this cartoon over here. You know, they argued, well, some miracle must occur and make the, make the, um, the system turbulent. But, uh, you know, we should be a bit more explicit here about, about what, what goes on. So the breakthrough came in the early 90s when Steve Balbus and John Hawley recognized that um, weakly magnetized ionized accretion disks have a very fast and a very robust instability in them. And that instability will take the weak magnetic field and amplify it up um, exponentially. 
and the result would be vigorous turbulence in the gas that results in angular momentum transport. So this is the so-called magnetorotational instability, often called the Balbasori instability. Um, and sort of a footnote on this is, in fact, the, the instability itself had actually been recognized previously by um, a Russian author called Velikov and also by Chandrasekhar. Um, uh, but it hadn't been recognized, it had been sort of been buried in, in, in that literature and hadn't been recognized in its um, importance for accretion disks. So it was Balbus and Hawley who recognized the importance of this instability for, for accretion disk. For that, they were given the, the Shaw Prize in, in, in 2013. Um, of course, there's been, you know, this has formed the basis of literally thousands of papers that have been written since. Um, there, there are major contributions in the early days from, uh, in particular, I mean, there's three names in particular I call out out of the many, many people who have made profound con contributions. Charles Gammy, Jim Stone, um, Julian Crowley, they're just a few of the names of people who, who really have, uh, have in, in addition to Balbus and Hawley, have really shaped this, shaped this field. So just to sort of show how, how that works, uh, let me show you a simulation that, that I constructed uh, a little while ago. And it's a very simple simulation. So of course, we're talking about magnetized, um, magnetized gas. So the right framework here is magnetohydrodynamics. So this is a simulation of, magnetohydron of a magnetohydrodynamic disk um, around a point mass that I'm just describing in Newtonian gravity. The disk is thin. You can sort of see in this, uh, in this wedge here that it's a relatively thin, thin disk. And in the initial conditions, I'm going to assume it's a completely perfectly smooth Keplerian flow, so it's in orbit, completely smooth Keplerian flow, um, but there are some weak loops of magnetic field, and I've colored the magnetic field um, red here, so red is actually contours of magnetic pressure, so you can see these little red contours in here uh, is the magnetic field, and then I've, I've integrated this with the Pluto MHD code, and these are a few details of the, of the, um, of the run. So if I run that forward, you see that very quickly after you start it going, even though it started off with completely smooth um, compl uh, initial conditions, it uh, very quickly, the magnetic field gets strongly amplified by this magnetic rotation instability. The growth time scale of magnetic rotation instability is, is essentially the dynamical time. So it's um, the time it takes to go around you know, by, by um, pi radians or by, by one radian rather. And um, the result is quite vigorous turbulence in the disk. And it's this turbulence <coughs> that's, result that's responsible for the angular momentum transport. In particular, when you actually look into the, um, the, the detailed physics of, of how angular momentum is transported, it's the combination of BR times B phi. So the fluctuations in the radial magnetic field times fluctuations in the phi magnetic field, it's the, that correlation that is giving us the stress that we can then find is actually proportional to alpha times times p. So that's this is the basics of how of how this works. Okay, so does this give us our framework for understanding variability? Because remember the purpose of this, the focus of this talk is, is variability. So you might have thought that that this does. You know, here, here's the picture we have the magnetic rotation and stability. This is driving turbulence. So we just get turbulent fluctuations in our flow. Those are random turbulent fluctuations, which would give you um, random and you know, by central limit theorem, Gaussian luminosity fluctuations. And that's it, we're done. Um, so it's easy. Well, no, it's not, it's not, it doesn't actually turn out to be that straightforward. And we can see that by going back to the observations and seeing, well, what are some of the characteristics of the variability that we actually need to explain? So let me now sort of take a, take a step away from the theory and sort of go to, go to the observational side. Um, and let's look, at, let's look at a bit of data. So, so this is just a, a, an X, a random X and M light curve that I, I picked up for, um, a, a, another AGN, 1H0707, again, quite a variable AGN, um, variable on very short time scales. You can see that some of these flares really are only um, a few hours long. But if you were to make a histogram of the, um, of the flux, so just make a, you know, the, the, 
probability density distribution for this, um, for this light curve, you get this. You find that um, this is not a Gaussian process, that the, the, the fluctuations in luminosity are not Gaussian, but this looks much more like a kind of log normal sort of distribution. It's got this, this tail to it. If you take the logarithm of the, um, of the x-axis, this actually does look approximately, approximately Gaussian. Um, now, we find the same thing actually is true in many other AGN. We also find it's true in accreting stellar mass black holes. So if we look at um, Cygnus X1, for example, a very famous accreting stellar mass black hole, um, this is an exercise that was done some years ago by Phil Artley. If you look at the light curve for it, and again, um, make a histogram of the, pro of the probability of finding a particular um, flux, you, you get this curve here, which is actually fit remarkably well by a log normal. You know, there's something going on here, which is driving the probability, probability distribution function for the light curve to be log normal rather than the Gaussian. Now, hand in hand with being log normal, there's, there's, a, there's another fact, which is that the, um, this actually tends to, turns out to be sort of be a restatement of the same piece of, of, of phenomenology that uh, there's a relationship between the average flux of the object and the fluctuations at any given time. So the so-called RMS flux relationship, that um, the brighter the source is, the more strongly varying it is. Um, and, uh, and again, that's, that's actually hand in hand with, with the, the log normal. Um, now, another piece of phenomenology you find, or another fact you find when you look at the observations, is that uh, if you look at two different um, uh, parts of the spectrum, so for example, in the stellar mass black hole we're looking at, we can look at soft X-rays and hard X-rays, we find um, some interesting facts. We find firstly that uh, they are very coherent across a certain range of frequencies. So medium level fluctuations or medium timescale fluctuations we find, for example, the um, you know, zero to four kV band is, is, is very closely matching, is very coherent with the uh, eight to 14 kV band. But then when you go to the fastest fluctuations, those which are going on you know, above 10 Hertz or, or more, that coherence falls apart. The other thing you find is that there's a time delay between different energy bands, that if you look at um, different bands, which uh, we basically maps to looking at different parts to the accretion disk, you know, different uh, zones of the accretion disk where the temperature is different, you find there's time delays. And some of these time delays are very long. So for example, let's look at, again, the Cygnus X1 in this right-hand plot. You can see, for example, looking at the um, two to four and four to six kV time delays, which are looking at two different radii in the accretion disk. Um, the time delay firstly depends upon the actual time scale of the fluctuations, which is interesting. But then also the time delay can be as much as you know um, a hundredth of a second, which doesn't seem like long. But remember that for these kind of um, systems, the, the, the typical, for example, orbital time around the black hole will be much faster, will be you know, down below a millisecond. So, um, so there's, there's, there's long time delays imposed on, the, on, these, on these signals. So there's clearly a lot of structure in this, in this variability that we, we have to understand. And it goes way beyond just having randomly added, um, randomly added turbulent fluctuations that give us some, some Gaussian, some Gaussian um, features. So there was a framework, a very important framework put together in um, 90, by, by Lubarsky in 1997, and subsequently developed, developed by others. And it's called the propagating fluctuations model. And the idea here is actually quite, quite, quite simple, but also quite neat. The idea is that um, if you think of the accretion disk um, as Shakur and Sanyev did, so you think of it as this viscous accretion disk, um, with the amount level of viscosity dictated by this alpha parameter. 
then um, if alpha is just a constant, then the disk will actually just find a steady state and won't fluctuate at all and just lock into some steady state. But what they argued is, well, we know that in actuality, the angular momentum transport is a turbulent process. So let's assume that at each given radius, um, the alpha, the, the alpha that characterizes angular momentum transport is a stochastic variable. So it's just, it's just randomly fluctuating around. And the random fluctuations in that variable will lead to random fluctuations in the local accretion rate. And then that gets handed off to the next radius. And that will be modulated by some random fluctuations in, in the viscosity. And then those accretion rate fluctuations will be handed downwards to the next level. And the idea is that you end up with a bunch of, of, of um, random processes mo multiplicatively modulating the incoming um, accretion flow. And if you take a process uh, if you if you if you take a, quant a quantity and multiplicatively um, uh, act on it with a bunch of random processes, then you get a log normal distribution, basically sort of a, a the central limit theorem in, in log space. Um, so so this is a framework that was put together in the nineties, but 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 you know the the analytic treatment of it actually could only be done. Uh, assuming very small fluctuations and actually missed everything I just talked about. Um, so the question that we're going to address for much of the rest of the talk is um, what do computer simulations have to say about this model? Can we, can we capture this model in, um, in simulations? So that's the question we're going to, we're going to tackle in, um, in the rest of this talk. But at this point, I think it's a good time to, to stop and take any questions that may have may have arisen. Okay, so if you have any questions for Chris, please you know either speak up or you know, just leave a leave it in chat box like so I can see it. Any questions so far? So I can start one. So the plot showing the time lag, the time lag uh, between like uh, you know, as a function of the frequency. So it's like yes. kind of frequency dependent or? Yes, yeah. So, so the, um, the, it's an interesting, when, when you first come across this, it seems a bit confusing, but the, it's an interesting fact that different time scale, uh, variability can have different time lags. And the, the way to think about this is um, as a Fourier transform problem. So you imagine taking your two light curves that, that you want to, to look for a time lag in and taking, you know, breaking each light curve up into its Fourier components. Well, now you can imagine that when you start to match different Fourier components, you know, when you match given Fourier components in different light curves, each component can have a different lag. It can slide around differently. Um, and in fact, that's, that's, that's what we find is, is, is true, that okay. each Fourier component can actually have different time lags. Sometimes it can even have different signs. So in fact, we, you know, that we, we've, we've found um, objects where you know, very fast flares can, um, in, in one light curve, can lead the flares in another light curve but long time scale undulations can lag. So, um, so you can often, you can sometimes find there's even different signs, signs there. Okay. I thought that's um, probably due to like I don't know, gravity or something you know, like a gravitation effect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in um, one, one way to, I mean, one way to think of this, um, if you want to sort of think of it in a, in a mathematical way, is that if you take sort of two, two light curves um, that are sort of coherent with each other, then in, in general terms, what's happening is you, could, you know, one is a, is a convolution of the other. You know, there's some, there's, some, okay. um, there's some transfer function that's taking one to the other. And in general, that transfer function, I mean, if, it, if it's a simple time lag, that transfer function is just a, a delta function. It's, a, it's like a delayed delta function. Um, but it can be much, obviously much more complex than that. 
Now, what, you, what you're looking at in some of these time lags is a sort of a facet of the Fourier transform of that um, transfer function. Okay. Um, if, if that, I mean, it's, it's one aspect, it's uh, right. of that. So yeah, I think we have three questions here. Um, let yeah. me, so the first one is like, uh, what information uh, can we get from the hardness radio variability in your page seven, like a slide number seven. So what kind of information we can get from the hardness ratio variability? Oh, <clears throat> that's, a very, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, I could have put this up without, uh, without much, much discussion. Um, so, so yes, you can sort of very, very, you can visually see in this in this plot that the soft X-ray light curve and the hard X-ray light curve are, are, I mean, they know about each other, but but are subtly different. Yeah, especially some of the flares are much stronger in the in the hard X-ray. So this can tell us about um, either changes in the spectrum that are correlated with changes in the in the flux. So, for example. If, um, if during a flare, the spectrum suddenly grows a, high, a much stronger high energy tail, then that will show up as, a, as an increase in the hardness during the flare. Um, it can also tell us, uh, in the extra band at least, it can tell us about uh, absorption, about the role of absorption. You know, if, uh, if there's cold gas that, that intervenes in the line of sight, that will preferentially um, preferentially affects the soft X-rays, so the soft X-rays would would be diminished by the by the by the, the absorption as opposed to the hard X-rays, and that would again show up as a as a hardening. So um, so it's not unique. You know you you can't you can't uh, you have to do it in the context of a of a spectral model. Um, but uh, yes, the the fact that the the hardness is, is changing, is telling you that something in the spectral model is changing, either the, um, the intrinsic hardness of the spectrum or there's absorption in this intervening. Okay. So, yeah, I think the second question and third question is probably related. So it's the fluctuation cost variability, you know, is this variability seen all bands and Third question is how about the optical variability? Are they matched to the MRI model? Or good question. Um, let me see if I've. I know I've got a slide that I kept. Pull this slide. But I, I wasn't going to show this for the sake of time, but this that's a very good question. Um, this is actually some uh, a very nice campaign that was done by Rick Edelson. Um, involving the SWIFT satellite and also HST and also ground-based, um, some ground-based observing. Uh, and this is for a, a very famous AGN called um, NGC 5548. And you can see here, uh, he was trying to answer exactly this question of, of what, what's the variability like across the, across the wave band. So this is ordered by you know, X-ray at the top and then going progressively redder, you know, so HST, UV bands, um, and then going into the optical band, um, ending up with the V band down here. So you can see here that yes, there's actually variability um, in all bands. It's a very, very characteristic. Uh, it, it, it's a very common characteristic of AGN that they're variable in, in all bands. Um, but you always see much more rapid variability in the X-rays, and we think that must be associated with the fact that the X-rays are coming from the very central parts of the accretion disk, uh, or um, and indeed in the AGN, almost certainly are coming not even from the, the real disk itself, but from some energized corona that's associated with the central, the very central parts of the disk. Then as you go um, as you go further out, you find that uh, there's there's strongly correlated variability in the optical, in the UV and optical bands. Now, in many objects, um, and this is this is a, 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 a can be a big debate actually. But in 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 many objects, uh, and this is one example, um, the optical and UV 
is thought to actually be responding to the x-ray, that the x-ray is actually irradiating the optical and UV. So if you want sort of your, um, your view of what's really going on, you know, what's the intrinsic um, flux, what, what, what's the intrinsic driver, it's really you look at the x-ray. Um, in other objects, the optical UV actually is much more disconnected to, to, to the x-ray, but um, yeah, you do see that variability across, across the band. It's a good question. Okay. Does, that, does, that address, does that address the question? Yeah, I think so. So yeah, it looks like X-ray has many, you know, many advantages, like it probes yeah. a much inner part of a um, black hole. And that's right. That's right. I mean, it, you know, it, and don't get me wrong, it's actually a, a very I mean, um, interesting question whether there is also disconnected variability in the other bands too. Um, I mean, okay. that, that's actually something we're, we're trying to think very hard about right now. Um, but, uh, but in many objects, such as this one, for example, it does seem like the X-ray is the driver for a lot of the, of the rapid variability that we see. Right. OK, so maybe one last question here before we move on. So, uh, so OK, so he said it's a simple question. There are several light curves for different part of the accretion disk. But how can we get the observations if there, uh, does that mean the resolution is high enough to see the disk structure? Good question. So I think this refers to this one. Uh, yeah, so the, in this card, I didn't explain this very well. In this cartoon here, um, what, what was, what, what's being shown is that the, uh, if you think about what's happening to the inward mass accretion rate, the outer disk is modulating it quite slowly because processes in the outer disk are, are slow and the orbital time is long. And then it gets handed to a part that's modulating it faster and then gets handed to an inner part that's modulating it even faster. Now, what, what you actually see coming out from the central part of the disk, which is the energetically dominant part, what you actually see is in some sense a superposition of all of these things. So we only see one light curve. We, we, we don't have, you know, with the one exception, of course, of M87, where um, we have the beautiful EHT data, um, we don't, we can't sort of spatially separate out different parts of the, um, of the disk. Uh, and so what we see is the one light curve coming out of the whole, the whole system. Yeah, so in, so in this plot, this is just showing, showing how this was broken up into different bits. Yeah, good question. Right. Okay, great. So I suggest we move on and we'll take the rest of the questions after the uh, your talk. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, thank you. Right. So that's um, the question I'm going to go address now. See if I can. My pointer is a bit lost. Ah. The question I'm going to address now is. Um, to look at the, try to look at the physics of this picture in the context of this um, MHD, uh, the MHD model of accretion that, that I've been I've been discussing. So can we understand what's going on here um, from first principles? Uh, so this is a study that I engaged in with with my former graduate student, my former PhD student, Drew Hogg, um, in Maryland, and um, our. The, the idea was to make you know, the best uh, simulation we could of the system that captured just the minimal physics we needed. Um, and the reason why we wanted to capture the minimal physics is that we wanted to do the highest possible resolution um, study uh, simulation, and we needed to run it for a very long time. So why did we need to do high resolution? We need to do high resolution because we need to capture the turbulence in the accretion in the accretion disk very well, and I'll describe in a, in a in a short while why it's so important to capture the details of the turbulence in the uh, in the interior of the disk, and then we need to um, integrate these. We need to run these simulations for a very long time because we want to start looking at the data, the simulated data, in the same way we look at real light curves. And real light curves are actually quite long in the sense that they probe many, many, many orbits of the material around, around the black hole. Um, so we, we look at, uh, in, in this simulation I'll show you, the, show you first, we looked at 2000 inner orbits of the accretion disk. So in the inside of the disk, it's gone around 2000 times. 
which at the time that we did this was actually one of the longest MHD runs uh, done yet of, of an accretion disk. So um, we set this, this disk up. The physics is very simple. We have a pseudo-Newtonian gravity, meaning that we don't, we don't do any GR because GR is expensive computationally and would force us to compromise in either resolution or, or run length. Um, we do pseudo-Newtonian, meaning that we modify the Newtonian potential. It's not one over R. We have one over R minus spatial radius. And that actually changes the gravitational potential, um, which it sort of gives us a first order approximation to GR. And in particular, it gives us the innermost stable circular orbit, which you can actually see in this rendering as sort of a, a location where suddenly the disk density becomes very small because inside of here, the disk is basically plunging inwards to the, to, into the black hole. Um, we keep the disk thin, we need, to, we need to have a simple cooling function applied to keep the disk thin, or else you know, accretion would lead to, to heating of the disk, which would lead to the whole thing blowing up. Um, and then we just have simple Newtonian MHD. So with that, with such simple physics, what do we find? Well, we find, lo and behold, we actually get um, a time variability that looks very much like the kind of variability that, um, that we're looking for. So, this is the mass accretion rate across the most stable circuit orbit. And you can actually see by eye that this has a log normal character, meaning that it spends a lot of its time down at fairly low levels. And then it has these big flares that, that, that go up to, to a high level. That's sort of what a log normal light curve looks like. And indeed, if we make the probability histogram, we find it is actually log normal. We find the um, RMS flux relationship that comes from that. And then here I'm showing the power spectrum of the, um, of this, of, uh, of this um, variability. So, um, so that's, you know, we haven't actually tried at all, but we got, we got the right answer. Um, we can then also, this is mass accretion rate uh, across the most stable circular orbit, which is not really luminosity, um, but we can sort of, try to infer what the luminosity of the disk would be, which involves an integration over, over radii. Uh, so it smooths it out a bit because we're integrating over radii, but again, it actually looks to have the right character. So it's again, got this flary nature to it, which, um, which is sort of the log normal characteristics and gives us or everything, everything we're looking for. The power spectrum we see now has a bit of a, of a bend in it. So like a, got a broken, broken power law nature to it. So um, because we have, a, we, we're getting the right answer, but now we have it in a simulation. So we can actually dive into the simulation and we can see you know, exactly what's going on. So if we, if we dive in, um, we can start to pick apart different radii and see what's happening. So this shows us something in the simulation that we can't do in observations. We can't look at, um, for example, mass accretion rate or emission um, throughout the disk in, in observations. In the simulation, we can. And we find, for example, that as a function of time, um, the mass accretion rate, we sort of have these waves of mass accretion rates that are coming in. Um, and the same for emission. We have these sort of waves of emission that are coming in. Again, this is actually exactly what we expect from the propagating fluctuations picture that I sort of cartoon that I put up, that we have these um, waves of, of um, uh, or patterns, if you like, patterns of mass accretion rate and emission that are in the, that are, that are in the disk. Um, so the question is, great, the simulation is giving us the, the right answer. Um, so how is this actually working? Well. In the Lebowski picture, the, uh, the, the, uh, the key is that the angiomentum transport at some given location in disk is fluctuating away. And we can ask the question, well, great, you know, on what time scale is it, is it fluctuating? So we can, we can address that by taking a power spectrum of the, uh, of the angiomentum transport. I, mean, I mentioned the angiomentum transport is given by the product of um, BR times B phi, so the radial field times the azimuth field. And so here I'm showing the power spectrum at three different radii in the disk um, as a function of frequency now, 15 gravitational radii, 20 gravitational radii, 25 gravitational radii. And you see in each case a big spike 
at the um, at, at a particular frequency. You know, in this, it's ten to the minus three in these units. Interestingly, the the um, dashed red line here is at is the frequency is, is the dynamical frequency of this disk. This is the typical frequency you'd expect the turbulence to be operating on. So you can see that the spike in that we're getting in angular momentum tr um, transport, or the, the time scales that in which the angular momentum transport is being modulated, is actually rather um, slower than the typical time scales for the turbulence to, to, to evolve on. Um, so you know that that that's interesting. So so what what else is evolving on this time scale here? What we can also do um, and is to take a power spectrum of just the average um, azimuthal magnetic field um, B B phi, and lo and behold, we get this big spike um, in in the power spectrum of of B phi. Uh, coincident, you know, similar similar time scales to to this spike here. So this is a clue of what's going on. So what we can do now is, is, um, is the following. We can take our accretion disk uh, you know, in our computer. We can pick some particular radius. And then at that particular radius, we can um, make an azimuthal average of the um, toroidal magnetic field of B phi as a function of height in the disk. So I'm going to show you a space-time diagram. So, so height is on the on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis of the average magnetic field, the average phi magnetic field at some particular radius. And what we get is, is this. So we get this very striking in B phi here, the, the average magnetic field, there's very striking um, pattern of alternating um, uh, alternating sine field that's getting expelled out of the disk. So what we're uncovering is that we are having bundles of magnetic field that um, are being expelled from the disk with alternating signs. And it's a little harder to see, but if you start to stare between you know, this space-time diagram and the equivalent one showing the BRB phi correlation, um, you can start to see places where this is matching up. So in fact, the uh, what what this kind of analysis shows us is that the angular momentum fluctuation, the, the fluctuations in angular momentum transport, are actually being dominated by whatever is giving us this um, this nice periodic or semi periodic um, pattern here. Now, this is very reminiscent of another phenomenon in astronomy, um, and that's the the sunspot cycle. So this is the this is the very very famous butterfly diagram for the sun, where if you plot number of sunspots versus time, you get um, these uh, these these diagrams here, and we understand that um, in the sun this is a manifestation of a dynamo of a, of a of an MHD dynamo, and in particular what we're seeing here is a is a dynamo cycle. It's a it's a periodic. Um, a periodic reversal of fields that that you cut that naturally arises in the in the solar dynamo. So that's what we believe we're seeing here. We're seeing these dynamo dynamo cycles. Um, now, one for the sake of time, I will I will go through the next couple of slides very very quickly. But you know, you can actually analyze uh, the dynamo cycles using the simplest way to analyze a dynamo is something called mean fields dynamo analysis or mean field analysis. Um, and this, to, to sort of very briefly state this, this is where you start off with the basic induction equation of MHD. So this is essentially the flux freezing condition in, in MHD that tells you that magnetic flux is frozen into the accretion disk, uh, sorry, fro frozen into the, into the plasma. Um, and then you assume that your magnetic field is composed of a, an average large scale parts that I call here B, B bar, plus some small scale perturbation, little b. And you assume the same is true for the velocities in the gas. You assume the velocity is equal to some large scale velocity U bar plus little u. And you carry that through the analysis. And what you find is that um, the 
you can now write an equation for the evolution of the large scale field in terms of this, uh, which includes this thing epsilon here, which is a correlation between velocity and magnetic perturbations or velocity and magnetic fluctuations. And so if, if, if these, um, if, if you, little u and little b are correlated correctly, then this will actually give you a term that can lead to the growth of the large scale field and it can lead to reversals of the large scale field. You can get wave like behavior too. So, um, so when you track this through, uh, you can end up with an equation like, like this. This is a modified form of the induction equation. And now you have these two extra terms here that are related to properties of this fluctuation through these um, so-called dynamo coefficients, alpha and beta. So, I mean, I went through this very quickly, but the short version is that you can put this into, into um, the framework and language of dynamos and start to analyze the simulations to see, well, you know, can I, for example, measure these dynamo, the, the dynamo coefficient alpha? And that's something that, um, again, we did with Drew Hogg a couple of years later. Uh, he starts to explore the details of these dynamos. So this is a, um, from two particular thin accretion disks, an H over R of 0.05 uh, disk and one of, of 0 0.1. And you can start to measure these, these dynamo coefficients um, accordingly. So let me, let me come, come to a, a sort of the last, the last few minutes um, uh, describe how we can use some of this knowledge to look at, um, at real data and especially future data. So you know, let me sort of show you this. This is a, um, a light curve of an AGN from the Kepler satellite. You know, Kepler, of course, was, was mostly designed to look for exoplanets, fire um, uh, transits and, and uh, by, by taking light curves of stars. But there were some AGN in the Kepler field and it was very good at getting light curves of, of, of AGN. So this is one particular light curve of, of an AGN. Um, and some of the best power spectra we have of AGN have come from Kepler because of the very regular sampling over quite a long time. So these are power spectra of, um, of several AGN from uh, a paper by Krista Smith in, in, in 2018. So um, can we use you know, some of the theory that I've, uh, I've discussed to, to understand this? Um, and once we've done that, can we apply that to future data? And you know, one of the major revolutions that, will, that is coming is from the Vera Rubin Observatory and its um, legacy survey in space and time, uh, LSST. Uh, this observatory will obtain light curves for literally millions of AGN over the sky. There'll be of order of thousands measurements for these, you know, for these objects spread over 10 years of the survey. Um, so we're going to get this mountain of data. And if we can actually use the variability and understand what it's telling us about, say, black hole masses and disk physics, it will be an incredibly rich resource. Um, so can we use this theory to to, um, to guide us on that. So one problem we have is, is we can't run an MHD simulation um, long enough to really fully capture the behavior of, of the kind of objects that we'll be, we'll be looking at. But what we can do is take the findings of our, of our work and put it in the context of, um, of a reduced model. So we can uh, go back to some of the classic um, models of of accretion disks, of viscous accretion disks. Uh, if you combine the conservation of mass and angular momentum in a, in a simple viscous accretion disk model, you end up with, with this equation for the surface density, um, sigma. And in here is the, efficient, is the effective viscosity. This is the turbulent viscosity, this new quantity here. And sort of following the approach that uh, Lubarsky uh, pioneered back in the late 90s, we can treat this um, using the alpha description, and we can take alpha to be a stochastic parameter. So um, here, I've, I've, there's a couple of different forms we can use for alpha in terms of this quantity beta, which is just a damped random walk. Beta is, is, is driven, given by a damped random walk. 
And what, and then we can numerically integrate this um, using uh, models for beta that are guided by the MHD simulations I've just been talking about. So this is an exercise that my current uh, PhD student, Sam Turner, had, has recently just published. And in the, these are some, some light curves and log normal um, uh, distributions from, from his work. But what he also finds is, uh, and then that's not Mr. What he also finds is that uh, he can get some first principles understanding of the break frequency in the power spectra that we see from many age, for, that we see in many many systems. Um, this uh, this break is essentially related to the characteristic uh, driving time scales where we where the dominant uh, radiation is coming out of. Um, but you know, through this kind of reduced model, we can now um, write down approximate formulae for the break frequency in terms of various parameters of the system, including the, the, the mass. So with this kind of approach, we might be able to um, hopefully look at data from say LSST and start to really uh, uh, you know, measure the masses of an extremely large number of objects maybe also measure, for example, the, um, the disk thicknesses of, of those objects, um, especially if we start to hone this model down with, with, uh, with, with future, future studies. So at that point, I will um, put my conclusions up. Uh, the focus of this talk has been understanding the, the aperiodic variability in accreting systems. <clears throat> um, and showing you that the high resolution simulations find, find variability that essentially has the same properties as the observed signals. Um, and that the, this dynamo cycle that we've, we've, we've found in the, in the simulations is purely an emergent phenomenon. That you know, we, we didn't put anything in there in the simulations to get this cycle. It's purely an emergent phenomenon from the um, MRI driven turbulence that ends up actually being quite an important one for the, the physics of the, of the variability. And this hopefully will let us develop the tools we need to um, uh, extract black hole mass and disk properties from future time domain um, surveys. So at that point, I am happy to conclude and um, I can take any remaining questions. Thank you. Okay, fantastic, thanks Chris. So now it's time for, you know, if you have any questions, please uh, leave them in the box or you know, just speak up if you like. So I imagine that for like X-ray binaries, the variability would be much dramatic or shorter uh, compared to AGNs. That is right. So I don't, I don't know if you caught on on this last plot here. Um, well, I guess I didn't scale this, but the, the, this this right hand plot was actually calculated uh, for an a, a black hole binary sort of scenario right. because of the, the energies we're considering here. Um, so basically you put, you know, 10 solar masses in there and that gives you the kind of breaks that you need. So the, the breaks would then be of um, you know, order 70 Hertz or so. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's, 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 so the, 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 the fundamental variability scales linearly with mass. Fundamental okay. Mass, uh, not... Right. <clears throat> Uh, Chris, yes, this is Wen Pin. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, I would like to uh, ask you about the uh, LSST. Yeah. Uh, I assume the uh, while it will find many, um, well, it will get many alerts, but the cadence, particularly if you consider different uh, filters, will still not be enough. So. Uh, <clears throat> So is it the idea that uh, you follow up some interesting possible variability and then with some different telescopes? Is that the idea? I think LSST itself is not sufficient. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess it depends upon exactly the time scales that end up being, being important. So I, th I think the, 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 the basic LSST, the actual survey itself, um, I, I think we'll get to have about a thousand um, pointings to each part of the sky over the course of ten years. That's ten years, so, right? 
over 10 years. So you know, that, that, that means that, um, and they won't be uniformly spaced, you know, obviously in some, the, so there'll be a, a non-uniformity in spacing. So if you think about, for example, making a power spectrum, you'll have some, some information down on the um, few days time scale. Um, mm -hmm. Most, but it'll be, it'll, it'll be sparse then. So if, if you have um, AGN, for example, maybe low mass, a low mass AGN that is uh, undergoing significant variability on much faster time scale than that, you'll miss it. Um, and for those kind of objects, uh, you would need other, other follow-up. For, for the, the more luminous, um, more distant AGN, and probably therefore the, the more massive black holes that probably will actually dominate the LSST um, AGN sample, mm -hmm. the expectation is that the, the, the typical time scales, for example, the break frequency time scales you need would be, um, might actually be in the in the realm where even just the basic LSST can can match it. Okay, um, you're you're quite right. I mean, I think one of I mean more broadly beyond even just this piece of science. I mean, one of the challenges in LSST is it will have so many alerts that um, people who are interested in in any of these kind of transient studies will have to design some very carefully crafted filters to just hone in on the on the, the kind of objects that you really care about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what about some X-ray surveys like EROS Theta or um, I don't know, other X-ray telescope, which is you know, more recent missions or yeah, I mean that, that that's a really good question. So um, I mean EROS Theta uh, will will give us some sparse information on this kind of AGN um, variability because you know, it broadly doesn't hit the, the it doesn't hit that many a given point in the sky that many times. Right. Something that has that has been quite exciting though is that uh, just a recently a few weeks ago we had a workshop on the synergies that would exist between LSST and Athena, which is the you know, the next big X-ray telescope that uh, European Space Agency is putting together. And um, you know, the time scales are, are a little in tension. You know, LSST will run from sort of the mid 2020s to the mid 2030s and Athena doesn't be launched until 31 or 32. Um, but uh, if the time scales can be made to work, then of course, Athena is an incredibly sensitive, powerful telescope that uh, if there was an interesting object that could be brought to bear um, to study in detail, very rapid variability in, a, in an AGM. Yeah. So the size of X-ray telescope, like a mirror size, does, is that a critical part to measure this variability, right? The size of the mirror, like, which may, it, might increase the counter rate or something else. Yes, know. yeah. I mean, it depends exactly what, 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 you're, what you're after. I mean, if um, you know, one, one thing I didn't talk about at all is some of the work that's been going on to not only look at the, the variability itself, but in great detail, look at the spectral variability. So the fact that as the source is varying, the spectrum is changing too. And there's actually a huge amount of, of detail in that. For example, one of the things that's been found from XMM data on some of the brighter objects, you know, brighter local objects, is that we can see the, um, time delay, the reverberation, what we take to be the reverberation delay between um, continuum fluctuations and the broad iron line. Um, now, to do that kind of study needs extremely high quality data. You need a lot of photons um, coming in fast enough to do that kind of, that kind of spectral timing work. Um, and so, yes, I mean, for, uh, that will be one area that Athena will really, will really progress. For, for the more basic timing studies, um, it, where you're just basically are measuring the fluxes and looking at how those you know, power spectra, for example, those fluxes, the, the, you, you really don't need that particularly, that particularly big, big telescope. Okay. Okay, great. So, yeah, we have some questions from the audience. So the first question is, uh, is the dynamo, uh, dynamo cycle visible as some kind of specific 
uh, specific frequencies such as QPO? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. Um, so so yes, yeah, so as as probably the questioner um, is well aware of, um, especially in some stellar mass black holes, we do see QPOs, quasi periodic oscillations, and there's there's several different type families of them. Um, it is still very controversial what 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 gives them, what gives rise to them. Um, there's a particular one of the particular types of QPOs called the Type C type C low frequency QPOs um, that uh, I actually, I mean, I've, I've published a paper some time ago suggesting that these dynamo cycles are actually responsible for those, for those QPOs. Um, and I still think that's a viable model. I mean, do we know it's right? No, we don't. Um, the, there is a competing model which suggests that it's due to the lens tearing precession of, of an inner, um, uh, an inner thick accretion disk, but I think that um, it is at least possible that yes, some of these dynamo cycles manifest themselves as low frequency QPOs. Hmm. Okay, good. So the other question is uh, in the Smith 18 PSD, Smith at 018 PSD, they seem to show a flat area on the left of oh, the broken yes. power loop. Can that be explained by the MHD model? Yes. Um, so th this this region here, I think, is 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 um, is the one that's being discussed. This is uh, I, um, this is the manifestation of Poisson noise in the power spectra. So I think this is this is a, this is a, a noise floor. I think in the um, in in these power spectra. Uh, it's it's a it's a good question. I I, I didn't I I didn't explain that at all when I put okay. this put it up. Um, sort of the, on on quite general grounds. Um, eventually, the the power spectrum has to become steep um, beyond some particular point, because of course the total energy um, included in the in the spectrum is uh, is a, is an integral over this whole thing. So sort of by, you know, to, to keep that integral bounded, the spectrum has to become steep at some point. Um, but yeah, I think this, this flatness here is actually a press on noise, press on noise floor. That's a, it's a good question. I, I, didn't, I didn't explain that. Okay. So another question is um, still a bit confused that how the accretion disk thickness scale fluctuation cause the variability with time scale in seconds. So I think um, this there's there's two issues to say here. So this might be related to this this um, equation, possibly. That why is there a why is there a dependence in in there? Um, it's, this is this is int interesting um, and and not not at all obvious. Um, the For a start, the, in, in these models at least, so I'm just caveat, you know, this is all within these, within these models, the thicker, the thicker disks are much more variable than thinner disks because um, you can think of it as uh, there's, a, there's a coherence length across which the disk um, is, is, has one particular characteristic. That coherence length is basically the disk thickness so you can imagine breaking the radius of a disk up into, into cells, and each of those cells is, is, is fluctuating and doing its, doing its thing. Um, and then there's some range, um, of which is of order a factor of two only in radius, where most of the energy is coming out. So it's a question of sort of how many fluctuating cells do you have within that factor of two radius? If your disk is very, very thin, you have many, many, many cells, and there's an averaging process that goes on, and you end up with very little variability, with, a, with, a, with weak variability. If your disk is thick, you've only got a few of those fluctuating cells um, in your region where most of the energy is coming out. So the disk is highly variable. That also plays in to then, then a there's a secondary sort of asymmetry on that that plays into giving you this weak, this weak dependence on the 
um, on the disc thickness. So it's a it's a very interesting point that the questioner asks. There's actually a there is a, a, a dedicated discussion of that in in, the, in Sam's paper, uh, which I can, I can point you to. Um, the other the one other final interesting thing to say, which I, I didn't actually I skipped over this, is what another interesting aspect as you go to much thicker discs is that the, the nice well-behaved cycles fall apart when you go to the thickest discs. It turns out there's still a dynamo working here, um, but it's more disordered. There's still a dynamo and it still gives you these kind of fluctuations, but it's more disordered. So that's another aspect that plays into this. But thanks, a good, good question. Okay, so uh, more questions here. So are the uh, corona and disc wing important? in a time variability study? Um, yes, broadly, they are. Um, the, 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 I mean, the corona certainly is important uh, in AGN for, if you're talking about x-rays. Um, and uh, in, we, we, we still don't really have a full understanding of what the corona is. So, that, that leaves us a little bit, uh, that there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a gap, if you like, between some of the modeling we're doing and our computation of, of observables and sort of real life in that um, one, our best guess is that the corona, uh, the very central corona that's giving us the X-ray mission in the AGN is probably responding to the instantaneous mass accretion rate. So when I put the curves up for the instantaneous mass accretion rate, that's sort of what our proxy for, for X-ray emission. Um, but there is, but yeah, we don't have a complete understanding of, of, of the corona. In terms of disc winds, it can be important, especially if the wind is clumpy and um, there you can start to have absorption events. So uh, in many AGN, um, you can actually have some variable absorption that's at play, and that can happen in a clumpy disc wind. Okay, so um, one more question here. What may cause the periodicity in jet activity? What is the time scale of the dynamo cycle? Oh, so this is one of the early, I think the, um, the Hercules A, what I put up. Uh, again, a good good question. Um, yes, if it was uh, this. Sorry, this one. Um, it's it's a good question. We we. Um, I would say we, we don't fully know. I mean, one it it's prob it's almost certainly too slow to be dynamo cycles. Um, or probably um, one one possibility is that what we're seeing here is uh, is a is a limit cycle that's going on in the more outer parts of the disk. So, you know, the, there's there's been attempts to use the same kind of theoretical framework we use for cataclysmic variables, where there's a um, a limit cycle involving the hydrogenization instability and apply that to AGN disks. So basically you've got an AGN disk that is fed in some particular rate, but, um, and then it's, it's, it's the outer disk is, is cold and it's fed until there's enough mass there that the disk gets hot enough for hydrogen to ionize. Once hydrogen ionizes, the disk becomes active, it accretes, it floods inwards, you power the AGN, but in doing that, it drains the outer disk, and the outer disk cools off again, and then you need to you need to build it back up. So that that's sort of the, that's the picture that's used for um, cataclysmic variable uh, outbursts, and that is a that's a possible picture that, that that's at work here, or it, it it could be some long time scale magnetic reversals that that that, that go on. That that it could be another possibility. Okay, great. Uh, more questions. Oh, yeah, I've got one more here. So is the mass accretion rate uh, an important factor for the disk thickness variability, strength or frequency? Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. It, 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 the, um, 
the, the mass accretion rate, we believe, is probably the determining factor for the actual disk thickness. Um, in potentially quite a complex way, you know, the, the, uh, it's all a you know, the, the, the disk is thick because of pressure. And so you have to worry about how hot the disk is. So it's a question of heating versus cooling balance. And that can actually be quite a complex thing to track. So our best understanding right now is that if the disk, if the, if the mass accretion rate is very low, the disk is so tenuous it can't cool. So, it, so it's, it's very thick, it's very hot and thick. For example, the M87 disk with the EHT data is believed to be a very thick, very thick disk. Um, as you go above a certain critical accretion rate, uh, it can now cool very effectively and it becomes very thin. Um, and then as you go even to higher accretion rates and you start to get towards the Eddington limit, uh, you have radiation trapping within the flow and that again can increase the pressure, it can puff it up and the, the, thickness, the thickness increases. So uh, it can be a sort of rather complicated behavior with mass accretion rates, but, uh, but yes, mass accretion rate is probably the, the, the dominant parameter that, that is setting this. Okay. Uh, any more questions for Chris? So I think we have many good questions today. Yeah, um, no, very, 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 very good questions. Yeah, it's very, very interested in your talk. Yeah, yeah that's a very nice talk. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I think um, that's the end of today's talk. Yeah, thanks for everyone you know, for joining. I think that's very successful. And thanks again, Chris, for you know staying with us. Yeah. <laughs> So hopefully we'll, we'll see you again. No, yes, well, thank you. thank you again for the invitation. And um, I do look forward to the opportunity to uh, to come and see you in person. Yeah, yeah hopefully. I, you never know. Yeah. Some, you know <laughs> yeah. The, the, current, the current situation will end. Uh, life, life, yeah. will be, life will be normal again. So. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care. Bye.